Well, welcome to our Sunday service here at Scarsdale Community Baptist Church. It's great to see all of you in person. For those who are joining online, welcome. I hope this service edifies your heart. Let's begin with a call to worship today. While strolling along the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon Peter and Andrew. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. Let's stand together and sing a hymn of praise, a mighty fortress, our God.
We come to you, O God, our creator and redeemer, our sustainer. We seek to magnify you and praise you as we ought. We want to see Jesus in whom all of your fullness dwells. We ask your presence with us. You are the giver of all we have and our only hope in life and in death. May the memory of your goodness and the love that you lavish upon us through Jesus Christ, may it fill our hearts with true gratitude and joy. Together, let's say, we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. morning. Oh, it's quiet in the sanctuary today. There's plenty of room, people, at home if you want to come and worship with us in person. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. I want to welcome our visitors. I don't know if I see any visitors today. Um, just a couple of very short announcements. The middle school youth group um, has a meeting uh, this Thursday night from seven uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, as we ease back into fellowship hour each week, we're looking for people to host uh, um, with single serve waters and chips or pretzels uh, outside uh, and, and by the back parking lot, you can contact the church office or me or just contact the church office or me if you would like to do that. Uh, the sidewalk sale, the Scarsdale sidewalk sale, uh, I believe it begins this Wednesday, but we will be having a presence on Friday and Saturday morning, even if you haven't signed up to kind of man the table and, and just greet people in the name of SCBC, uh, plan to stop by and just say hello. Um, I, I, believe, or I don't know if all the spots are taken. If you would like to come and be a part of our official team, go speak with Neil. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Our first gospel reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, which can be found on page 34 of your pew Bibles. Matthew, chapter 28, starting at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he said, hey, you knuckleheads. What's it going to take to you finally have some faith? That's not what Jesus said. That's what the pastor planted to cue up his, his sermon, and he assured me it's not sacrilege. So. <laughs> Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Will. I vouch for him. I made him read it that way because I want you thinking about what it means that we incorporate doubt into our discipleship, but that's for the sermon. Now, as a community, let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning because you welcome us. You say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. For my yoke is light and my burden is easy. And so, Lord, we come to you bearing burdens, professional burdens of having too many things to do in too few hours. Lord, give us peace, trusting that your achievement, not our own, is what is most central to our identities. And let us have rest in that. We come bearing emotional burdens of of caring for someone who is sick or ailing. Lord, give us peace, knowing that you are Jehovah Rapha, that you can and will heal the sick and even raise the dead. God, give us hope in you and trust in your wisdom. God, we come today bearing spiritual burdens, feeling far off from, feeling far off from you, Lord. Prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. Here's our heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thine courts above. Lord, give us hope in this reality that you pursue us. Even when we are cold and far from you, Lord, you cherish us and will pursue us to the very edges of your capacity. And so, Lord, where minds have grown dull, sharpen them. Where hearts have grown cold, warm them. And where hands have grown lazy, Lord, engage them in your gospel. Lord Jesus, we come to you today in order to lift you on high. As the one through whom and for whom existence finds its culmination, you are the one who the angels proclaim, holy, holy, holy. You are the lamb who has conquered through love and sacrifice. Salvation, Lord, is not merely found in you entering our life, in as much as it as we who get to enter your life, that eternal life. Lord, give us a glimpse today of that life and minister to our hearts in exactly the way that we need to be ministered to. And Lord, our hearts break for the world as we read the news on a daily basis. With creation, we groan for you to set this world right, for the fires in the Pacific Northwest, for the floods in Europe, For the monsoon in India, Lord, all of which have cost people their lives, Lord, please heal those lands and heal our land. Work through their governments to support people, and Lord, work through your church. Give us the courage to speak out. Give us the courage to invest ourselves and our money to make your gospel glorious. And give us the passion and conviction, Lord, to go and to make disciples. And last, I pray for those who are gathered here and those who are watching online. Please clear our minds for worship, Lord, that we may see and experience you. If we have been wronged, Lord, and if that clouds our mind, give us the capacity to extend forgiveness. Where we have made enemies, Lord, or where enemies have been made for us, give us the desire deep within us to make them into friends through your gospel. And Lord, where we have been wronged, give us the ability to extend forgiveness knowing, Jesus, that you have forgiven us. But in all these things, clear our minds so that we might worship and experience you this Sunday. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Our second lesson will be taken from Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. This can be found in the New Testament portion of your Pew Bible on page 188. Galatians 2, chap chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer in me. It is no longer I who, I, I who live, I'm sorry, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the law. How privileged are we to have such wonderful little ones in our congregation? I think it's absolutely amazing that we have so many kids here who we get to teach the gospel to. Um, anyway, I just thought that would be an amen moment. Um, as we uh, step into our sermon for today, uh, I just want to remind us that we're in the second part of a uh, sermon series, the final part of a sermon series, which is pretty basic. It's just go and make disciples. Last week, we talked about this reality that we are called to go, and I I still want to continue to challenge us. Like who, who are we called to go to? If it takes us more than a minute to answer that question, chances are we don't really know or we don't have an intentionality for who we're called to go to and we're not following Jesus as closely as we could. And that's a challenge for all of us, including myself. We have to be intentional about the, the season of ministry that we're in. Maybe you're called to go to family or children or grandparents or coworkers, but know who you're called to go and be intentional about that. However, the call to go doesn't mean much without the command we're talking about today, which is the command, go and make disciples. There are lots of books published today about what it means to make disciples. There's lots of different pastors who will tell you different things about how we are to make disciples. But I bet for many of us, making disciples is still kind of a vague concept. And so in today's sermon, I want to help you put some handles on this concept of what it means to make disciples. I want you Able to wrap your hands around this idea and actually be able to carry it someplace. And so the Great Commission is out of Matthew 28. We're going to be there all day long. And so I invite you just to, to have it open and to keep it open, maybe on your smart devices if you prefer an iPhone. I sometimes prefer an iPhone. You can have it open in your iPhone as well. I don't judge at all. Jesus doesn't judge you as well. The Bible is the Bible. But let's have our, our smart devices or our Bibles open to Matthew 28. And as we read through Matthew 28, and we discern based on the, the, the descriptions that Jesus gives us how we're to make disciples, I think there are at least three basic points or three basic handles that we can have around what it means to actually make disciples. And I'm going to make it easy for you. These are the three points for today's sermon. And so if you're a note taker, you can jot down these three points. To make disciples, we need to do three things. We need to leverage doubt, which is why I had Will read the way he read we need to leverage doubt, we need to leverage a person, and we need to leverage a community. And those are we need to leverage doubt, we need to leverage a person, and we need to leverage a community. And so what, what do I mean in that first point? We need to be able to leverage doubt. Let me just describe for you what my earliest moments were kind of growing as a disciple. And I, I'm not talking about hearing about the gospel as a five-year-old or a six-year-old. I'm talking about real steps forward in my journey of faith. And so I began to discover Jesus after my parents divorced. And in the wake of my parents divorcing, I needed a role model. And so I is a younger brother in this, in this congregation or watching online right now, you know what the kind of pull that you have when you have an older brother. You just want to emulate your older brother. And so my, my brother taught me how to do two things. The first of which is good, right? He, he taught me how to ask great questions of the Bible. 
One thing my brother taught me how to do was how to smoke cigarettes, and so I don't necessarily endorse the second point, but that first point, I, I, I heavily endorse it. My brother brought me to a community of his friends after my parents divorced. And I, I still remember the conversations we would have. We'd go to this pizza joint in Wisconsin. It was called Frank's Pizza Palace. And there he and his friends would wrestle with faith, but not in a, in a, in a cl- cliche, godly way where the conversation's really clean. My brother and his friends would legitimately wrestle with deep questions of faith. And not, not just cliche questions, again, like how can a good God allow bad things to happen in his world, but deeper questions, questions that, that struck more to the heart of what they were really wrestling with. Questions like how, how can the church, which is so rich in America, seem to be so stingy towards the poor? How is it the pastors that garner so much respect tend to fall and embarrass themselves? Like how, how is it that, that Jesus, who on, on, on one week seems so close to us in our worship, can seem so distant how, how is that possible? My brother and his friends would wrestle through all of these questions, and there was something about their honest wrestling with doubt. There was something about them, their, uh, their honest wrestling with skepticism that absolutely drew me into them. I, I was like a, 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 a moth to the fire, but in the best way possible. I wasn't going to my doom. I was going to my blessing. My brother and his wrestling with his honest doubt did something. For me, it opened a doorway into my own journey of faith. And I think as Christians, sometimes we, we have this false assumption that somehow bad, that critique is somehow bad, that questions of Scripture somehow show our, our lack of faith. And I, I find it so refreshing that in Matthew 28, verse 17, we in fact see the opposite to be true. Now, one of the beautiful things about the Gospel of Matthew is this, is that by the time you get to chapter 28, which is the last chapter in this Gospel, you know that Jesus isn't afraid to call things out. Jesus doesn't pull his punches here. And so Jesus sees his uh, his disciples not only worshiping him, but then doubting. Is, is, Is what I'm experiencing really true? Is Jesus really who he says he is? And instead of castigating them, what does Jesus do? And all. I have to really think about that. Like, what does it mean that Jesus sees us in our doubt and then he still commissions us in our doubt? I think that in much the same way that Jesus used my brother to draw me into my walk of faith through his now Jesus commissions us as we wrestle with our doubts to invite people into them, to talk with them through them, albeit in an articulate, in a well thought out way. But Jesus invites us in our doubts to welcome people into conversation, because I guarantee you, they have the same doubts. I believe that many of us think that doubt is the opposite of faith, and that's just not true at all. Doubt is the context within which we actually have faith. And may I say that, that if, if God is who he says he is, he's not intimidated by our doubts. Like, God is surely self-confident. He's not threatened in any way, shape, or form by our doubts. And I think many of us operate in this, in this bizarre way of thinking where like, our doubts somehow threaten the glory of God when in fact they don't. We, we somehow think of it as like our doubts somehow threaten uh, loyalty to God when in fact they don't. Let me, let me give you a movie quote and I'll see if you can identify the person who says this. And so who, who knows who says this quote? I find your lack of faith disturbing. I need to say it in a deeper voice. Like, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Like, it's, it's James Earl Jones. You know who says that? It's Darth Vader. Yeah, any, any Star Wars fans in, in, who are watching or just are here in person? Like, I, I think oftentimes when we think about our doubts, we conceive of God more like Darth Vader than Jesus. Like, we think that, that Jesus is, in fact, out to get us if we doubt or if we question our faith, when, in fact, he doesn't do that at all. He sees our doubts. And then he to take our to go and to make disciples. And I would, in fact, go as far as to say this. If you're sitting here today and you've not actually wrestled with a season of doubt in your life, I went through about a decade between my early 20s and my early 30s where I wrestled with really difficult doubts. And from experience, there are answers. I promise you there are answers. But if you've not meaningfully wrestled with your doubts, whether you're a high schooler or whether you're retired, 
I, I really want to say this, that you are not equipped enough yet to actually begin to disciple someone. Because it's only when you wrestle with your doubts and you come through on the other side that you become equipped to be able to help someone wrestle through their own. There was a, a, a wonderful brother in Christ who about two weeks ago after service, he came up to me and very vulnerably said, you know, Pastor Dan, like, I, I am really wrestling right now. As I read the Old Testament and then, and then as I read the New Testament, I'm seeing a difference between these gods. How is the Old Testament God, how, how, how in any way, shape, or form does that relate to the New Testament God? And I wanted to give that brother the biggest hug in the world. If it wasn't COVID or if it wasn't socially inappropriate, I would have because I was so excited that he was actually wrestling with his doubts and then trusting his pastor to help him in that process. He will be a better father, He'll be a better, a, a better employee. He'll be a better friend. He'll be a better discipler precisely because he wasn't afraid of his doubts. And in fact, he used his doubts to engage his faith in deeper and more meaningful ways. And I, I, I kind of wrote out this statement, so I just want to read it for us. Jesus commissions his disciples to use their doubts as vehicles for teaching people what it actually means to follow Jesus. If we are to define discipleship as teaching someone to follow Jesus, and if one of the most common experiences of following Jesus is doubt, then one of the first things we need to do is to teach people what on earth we are supposed to do with our doubts. Oftentimes, as we think about our doubts, I think we visualize them or we conceptualize them as a pack of angry wolves that wants to tear our faith apart. And I think we need to reconceive of the way we conceptualize our doubts. They are not wolves. They're, they're ski dogs. They're pack dogs. What they need is not to be killed. What they need is to be marshaled. They want to take us someplace. As Christians, as believers, if we have not been through a meaningful season where we wrestle with our doubts, I invite you into this wonderful, beautiful reality that Christian thinkers over the last 2,000 years have wrestled alongside of you. There are good answers. Wrestle with your doubts. Marshal them and it'll make you a better disciple maker. I have experienced that, and I trust that you will experience that. And so practically speaking, what does this mean for you? If you don't have one person in your life right now, a spouse, a friend, you don't have anyone you can go and take your doubts to, right? Come to you. <laughs> you, you lived first of all but second of all you know where my office is come reach out to me i would love to help walk you through your doubts trust me i will give you stacks and stacks of books to read i will gladly buy you a cup of coffee like this is something we get to do together amen amen okay that's our first point let's not be afraid of our doubts the second thing we need we need to do in order to be great disciple makers is we need to leverage and here's what i mean by that it's very, very common in contemporary dialogue, in contemporary secular dialogue about Jesus, to think of Jesus merely as a nice teacher or a great teacher. And may I say that, in fact, he is. He's a great teacher. He teaches us great ethical norms. But oftentimes it's very common in, in, in contemporary dialogue to align Jesus with Buddha or with Muhammad, all of whom the people say just kind of point us to God and point us to great maxims or great ethical truths about God. And anyone who says that about Jesus, I want to say, just hasn't actually read the gospel. Because Jesus, yes, does teach us good ethical norms, but at least half of what Jesus talks about isn't just God. And it's not just kind ethical norms. Half of what Jesus talks about is himself. We need to wrestle with this reality. Now, Jesus doesn't show up on the scene and say, follow God. Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus is teaching, he's not just teaching ethical norms. He's not just teaching people how to follow God better. He's teaching people a dramatic and even controversial idea about who he is as the son of God, as God incarnate. I just revisit Matthew 28, 17 and 18 for a second. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Like what is about it is about Jesus he concludes the great commission by saying and surely I am with you to the end of the age whatever it looks like to walk with Jesus as disciples it means doing life with Jesus and in both of these cases Jesus is the center point 
Whatever it means to create disciples, yes, it means creating good ethical norms. Yes, it means teaching people how to be a good husband or good wife or good employee. All of those things are important, but those things are the satellites around which we orbit. Our center of gravity is the person of Jesus. But I think this begs a really interesting historical question. And so in the, in the first century, let's say 33 AD, J Jesus shows up on the scene after his resurrection, and he says, all authority has been given to me. Go now and make disciples. With having in mind this a fact that Jesus is now the one in whom all, all authority exists. They'll oftentimes ask a, the, the historical question, is why on earth would anyone in the first century want to gravitate towards someone who says, all authority has been given to me? And we, we think sometimes that we're alone in the, in the 21st century being skeptical about power and authority. But people in the first century were just as skeptical about power and authority. If we think about how Rome governed, there's a reason why, why after a senator finished his time in office, they put the senator on trial to make sure that he actually lived up to the expectations that he set for himself. Maybe we should consider doing that today. But there, there's a reason why they did that. They didn't trust their senators. Likewise, Jews in the first century, they didn't trust Herod. They didn't trust people in authority. And so why on earth would someone in the first century want to follow a group of people who say, all authority has been given to Jesus? And I think this is an important question for us in the 21st century. As we walk down our high school corridors, as we go to college, as we mentor grandkids, why on earth would someone in, in the 21st century want to follow someone who says, all authority has been given to me? Well, it really depends on how that person expresses authority, doesn't it? It really depends on how that king expresses his kingship. Whoever Jesus is, this is a fundamentally different version of what authority is. Keep your, your, your finger on Matthew 20. 17, and let's just go back like 12 verses to Matthew 28, 5, and here an angel says something that is absolutely amazing. Read with me. The angel says, don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. What, what kind of king gets crucified? What kind of a person with authority gets crucified? Whatever Jesus' vision of authority is, it's not our vision of authority. Like, what, whatever Jesus' vision of love is, it's not our vision of love. Whatever Jesus' vision of kingship is, it certainly isn't our vision of what kingship is. Jesus doesn't expect us to take the hit for him. He takes the hit for us. Jesus doesn't expect us to give something to him. He expects himself to give something to us. And this lit the first century world on fire. No one had ever seen a version of authority like this before. And may I say that this still has power. This can light the 21st century on, power, uh, on fire. I'm going to give you another movie quote. Let's see if you can name the, the, the person who says this. This is a little bit more obscure, but I think some of you may get it. Okay. People need dramatic examples, dramatic symbols to shape them out of their apathy and to show them new possibility. Does anyone know who said that? It's Batman in uh, the, uh, the Dark Knight. That, that, that's what Bruce Wayne says. And that's precisely what Jesus does. Right? He shocks us out of our apathy by giving us a new and dramatic symbol for what power, for what love, for what sacrifice really looks like. And to drive this point home, I find it, I find it no surprise that the Apostle Paul, when he's thinking about what Jesus means to him, when he's thinking about what discipleship really means to him, he quotes what Fabrina read for us in our second reading. It's Galatians 2.20. Paul could possibly be the smartest Christian to ever live. I just look at his resume. He had the whole Old Testament memorized. The whole Old Testament memorized, and he wrote a third of the New Testament. Whatever qualifies someone to be the best Christian ever, it's probably the Apostle Paul. And yet the Apostle Paul, when he's thinking about the heart of discipleship, when he's thinking about the heart of what Jesus means to him, he certainly doesn't say, man, Jesus' teaching is just amazing. He certainly doesn't say, the ethical norms of Jesus, his way of creating families is amazing. No, what, what does the Apostle Paul say? He gives us something out of Galatians 2.20 where he talks about what Jesus really means to him. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Notice that crucifixion language. This is a new vision of power. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life, I, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Just notice that. What, what, what does Paul see as the center of discipleship? It's, it's, it's not the teachings of Jesus. It is the person of Jesus who loved him and gave himself for him. And this affects us as disciple makers. We're not just leading people to better family values, although that is good. We're not just leading people to better driving habits, although that is good. We're leading people into how to be a better employee, although that is also good. But none of that is the heart of what it means to make a disciple. We need to leverage a person. Jesus puts himself at the center of the gospel for a reason, because he is the king who has given his life for us. And this affects us in deep and profound ways. We need to learn how to leverage telling that kind of story, that personal story. I, I, I specifically remember, remember, when I was in my mid-twenties, my dad was talking to me about what happened when my mom filed divorce papers on him. And now I, I was ready for this conversation. It was a decade later. But my, my dad, in, very vulner, in a vulnerable, real way, almost in tears, told me about how his life was in shambles, how he hated his work, how he hated his wife, how he hated the fact that he was in this position that he never intended to be in. And then he tells me about how in the church he encountered Jesus in a completely new way, and it healed and restored him. And he had, he had new energy with which to love his ex. That's difficult work. And he had new energy with which to love his kids now as a single parent. That's difficult work. And he had new energy with which now to go to work, knowing that he has to support a family on his own. That's difficult work. My dad invited me into this reality that, my, that he experienced Jesus as the king who loved him and gave himself for him, and it restored him in fundamentally new ways. And all of us have stories like this. All of us have stories like this to share. And we now get to leverage these stories to make disciples. I get to leverage them. You get to leverage them. And I invite you now in appropriate ways in your workplace, with your grandkids, with your kids, with your friends, Find, find moments to be able to share what Jesus really means to you. And I promise people will run from you, and quite the opposite. They'll be drawn into your orbit. People want to be around transparent people like that. Hey, let's leverage the person of Jesus and his work to restore us in order to make disciples. And last but not least, we also now lead to leverage a community. And this will be my fastest point. And I promise that I will only conclude with five points here. <laughs> We need to leverage a community in order to make disciples. What do I mean by that? Mo most of us, when we conceive of discipleship, we conceive of it in terms of one-on-one -on -one relationships. And that's true. Discipleship does happen in moments in one-on-one -on -one contexts. But it doesn't only happen in a one-on-one -on -one context. It also happens in the context of a community. And, and Jesus means for it to happen in the context of a community. And again, here's why I say this. I find it as no surprise that immediately after Jesus says, go and make disciples, he then tells them to well, What does it mean that Jesus tells his disciples to make disciples in the context of baptism? Well, what, what is baptism in the first few centuries of the church? Baptism was a rite of passage. It was the entrance place, the entrance place through which one became part of the community of God. Jesus had community in his mind when he was telling his disciples to go and make disciples. And so too for us, as a community here together, whether we're watching online or whether we're here in person, as a community with our communal life, we are called to make disciples. And I think this provides ways of actually engaging with culture. For those of you who work in high-stress positions, you know that your bosses expect a lot from you. And oftentimes it trains you to think about yourself only in terms of what you can produce. For those of you who work in family systems that are kind of dysfunctional, you know that sometimes your family system only loves you when you act accordingly. And the moment you stop acting accordingly, you lose their love in some way, shape, or form. The church actually has the capacity to shape and to form new people by putting new types of expectations on them. Even when people have nothing to offer, we want to offer them something because the church is a gift to the world. Even when perfect people don't behave the way we want them to, and Christians are no better than non-Christians. We all, we all sin. Even when people behave in the ways we don't want them to, we are a community of inclusion. We welcome them back because we love them. To be a counterintuitive community that people gather around, that people 
ask themselves the question, how is this community capable of producing men and women who can love in this type of way? We are called as a community, not just to produce disciples in our individual relationships, but we're called as a community to produce disciples in our community relationships. And I think this makes intuitive sense to us. Anyone who has been baptized for the first time knows that they show up to Sunday, the next Sunday, not really knowing exactly what it's like to offer their gifts and service to offer themselves in mutual submission to each other. They don't know the first thing about what it means to serve or to be engaged in the, in the community. They don't know the first thing about what it means to, to, to live in a holy way. Like they, they need to be mentored in the context of a community. And no one individual can actually bear that weight. Only, it's only a community's shoulders can bear the weight of discipleship. And again, I, I think we, we get this. Here's another example to give to you. It is virtually impossible for a parent with one child to teach their child what it means to be a sibling. What they need is another child to be born into the family so they, that way the family and that sibling can teach them what it's like to actually be a part of the family. And likewise, no, 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 no individual here can teach a new member or, an, or a new believer what it means to be a part of a community what it means to serve, what it means to love, what it means to give, what it, what it means to carry someone's burdens, that is something that we do together as a community. And I think that when we do that well, not only do we make disciples, but we show ourselves to be an alternative community that is absolutely attractive to a world that wants to consumerize people. And so Jesus calls us to make disciples in three distinct ways. And I want to challenge you, maybe just to focus on one of those ways this week. Jesus teaches us to leverage our doubts, he teaches us to leverage himself, to leverage a person in the way he's called to restore us. And he's teach, he teaches us to leverage this community in order to make disciples. And as your pastor and leader, that is the direction I hope we go over the next months and years together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you've called us to make disciples. Lord, may we wrestle with our doubts. May we experience you, the one true God who wants to restore our lives, Lord. And may we find a home in this community, and may we invite other people into this community. And all of that, Lord, in honoring you, may we make disciples. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, now we've come to uh, another portion of our worship service together where we get to offer up our tithes and offerings. You notice we don't have a worship plate up here because we are going to have the ushers come down and pass a plate. And so if you have your tithes or offerings, you're going to find them. They're just going to lean in. You don't need to pass them down. They're just going to lean in. You can offer them in the plate. But let's offer our tithes and offerings with a joyful and glad heart as the Bible instructs us. May I say, it was all right. There's always grace and forgiveness. Don't even worry about it. All right, come on. Now let me say a blessing on these tithes and offerings. Jesus, thank you for these cheerful givers, Lord, who give of their time, of their finances, Lord, and even of themselves to extend your gospel. Please bless these donations, Lord, to extend your gospel and to bless Westchester County. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
Please stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his countenance fall upon you and give you peace. And may that peace guard your hearts and mind with a peace surpassing all understanding. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Go in peace.